Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, are there any questions from last time? So if you remember, in the last lecture, we completed the proof of the theorem that a small perturbation of a linear map, of a contracting linear map, is topologically conjugate to the linear map. OK? And what I uh, mentioned at the end of the last lecture was that the definition of contracting linear map, so let me remind you, if we have a linear map it's contracting, if the norm of T, which is defined as the supremum, over all vectors of norm 1 of T of V is less than 1. Okay? So we proved that theorem in a very general setting of Banach spaces. So it's a very general theorem. Then I mentioned that if you remember in the finite dimensional case, in particular in the two dimensional case, the contracting condition is fairly strong. So for two-dimensional maps, T from R2 to R2, we have, um, we've seen many contracting, many examples of contracting maps like this. But we've also seen many examples of maps which are not contracting, This is not contracting because vectors are not contracted. Right? A vector at a certain distance from the origin may map further away from the origin temporarily. right? Because if you wait long enough, it's going to map closer to the origin. In fact, every point converges to the origin after iteration. So really, the dynamical properties are very similar. And in fact, as we proved in the first part of the course, these two are linearly conjugate they exhibit a very strong form of conjugacy. Right? There is a linear map that conjugates these two. However, the theorem, as we stated it here, does not apply to this situation. Because the theorem, as we stated, assumes that the, the linear map is contracting in this sense. Um, do you remember what was the condition that implied that a linear map was linearly conjugate to a contracting map like that? Excuse me? Exactly. If all the eigenvalues have norm less than 1. OK? So we can replace in the two-dimensional case. But in fact, we proved it in the two-dimensional case, but it's true in any dimensions, that if the eigenvalues have, all have norm less than 1, then, um, then the map is linearly conjugate to a contracting linear map that satisfies this condition, that the operator norm is less than 1. Okay, so what we're going to show is that in fact uh, this linear conjugacy allows us to define a norm on the system such that in this norm this linear map is contracting so that we can apply our theorem also in this case. So let me uh, be a little bit more precise. So let me state our proposition like this. Let A Rn to Rn be an invertible linear map which is linearly conjugate to a linear map B which is contracting. 
So I'm going to use that as an assumption. So as I said, in the two-dimensional case, this is always true as long as the eigenvalues of all have norm less than 1. In fact, this is also true in the higher dimensional case, but because we did not prove it, I will actually use directly as an assumption the fact that we have a linear conjugacy to a contracting linear map. Then there exists a norm star on Rn such that the norm of this operate of the linear map A in this norm is less than 1. So, recall that if P is the conjugacy, let P be the conjugacy, be the linear conjugacy. Between A and B, okay, then we have A n equals P bn p minus 1. If you remember, we saw that it's an easy calculation to show that if p conjugates a and b, then it conjugates all the iterates of a and b. And so the norm of a n, which is equal to the norm of p bn P minus 1, which is less than or equal to the norm of P times the norm of Bn times the norm of P minus 1, is less than or equal to, um, sorry, maybe I should have, let me, let me give a value to this norm, right? So let me call this lambda less than 1. So we have a specific value here. Then what we have here, that b to the n, of course, is less than or equal to lambda to the n. So this is less than or equal to p times norm of p minus 1 times lambda to the n. Which we can write so A n is less than or equal to C lambda to the n for all n less than greater than or equal to 1 for C equal to P, P minus 1. So this does not show that A is contracting because, of course, A in this norm is not necessarily contracting, but it shows that it's eventually contracting, as we know. Right? Because the fact that it's linearly conjugate to a contracting map, of course, means that also for A, all the, all the, uh, everything must converge to the origin and the forward iteration. And this gives a little bit more an explicit estimate of this convergence to the origin of every orbit. Right? It converges like this. So there's a constancy which in principle might be big. right? So this constancy, this kind of bound is very important. I'm sure you will have seen it in other situations before. What does this mean? This means that this C, in principle, this C might be very big, right? arbitrarily big, but it's a C that is fixed once and for all. It does not depend on N. So if C is very big, like 1 million, Okay, then when n is small, this is not 
might not be contracting at all. The norm of A, a, a the, uh, the second iterative of A or the third iterative of A is allowed to be very big because this is one million times whatever this is, a half or a half squared or a half cubed or whatever. But as N gets bigger, then at some point lambda to the N becomes smaller than 1 over C and this becomes less than 1, right? And so eventually when n becomes larger and larger, this still goes to zero exponentially fast at the rate lambda n. When n is very big, the value of the constant c does no longer plays a big role. But it plays a crucial role in dealing with n small because this is not really a contraction. Okay? So we have shown that a is, let's call it, eventually contracting. And now we're going to use this fact to construct the new norm in which A is constructing. Now we fix two constants. We fix some lambda tilde between lambda and 1. And we fix some n greater than or equal to 1, sufficiently large. So that C lambda over lambda tilde to the n minus 1 is less than 1. So this is the condition. So notice because we've chosen lambda tilde uh, bigger than lambda, then this is less than 1. And then for n sufficiently large, we have this for whatever constant c we have. OK. So this is just the key little trick. And then we define the new norm by v star equals the sum i equals 0 n minus 1 of lambda tilde minus i a i v. And then using this definition, we will get what we want. So in this case, we just want to estimate. We use directly the definition. We have that A v, the star norm of A v, is equal to, by definition, the sum i equals 0 n minus 1 of lambda tilde minus i, a i of a v. And we write this as the sum. Uh, I take one lambda tilde out, and so I can write this i equals 0 to n minus 1 of lambda tilde minus i plus 1 of a i plus 1 of v. And I can write this as, so I change the indexing a little bit, and I write this as lambda tilde sum i equals 0 of n minus 1 of lambda tilde minus i, a, i of v. So I've changed the indexing here from i plus 1 to i, and that means I have some extra terms. And if you check what extra terms we've got, we've got 1 minus lambda tilde v here, and 1 plus lambda tilde minus n minus 1 of a, n of v. And this is exactly the norm. So this here is equal to lambda tilde, the norm of v star. Um, minus lambda tilde v plus 
from the tilde minus n minus 1. Okay, n. This is n. Okay, so here I have written the new norm of the image of a V as the old norm plus these two terms which have one negative term and one positive term. So this is lambda tilde is less than 1. So as long as the bound is lambda tilde V star, I have a contraction by a factor lambda tilde which is less than 1. So all I need to show is that the sum of these two terms is negative, so I need to show that the positive term is less in absolute value than the, than the negative term. Okay? So I'm just going to write that here. So here we use the assumptions on lambda tilde and on n here, and we get exactly the estimate, the lambda tilde minus n minus 1 of a n v is, so now we use the, um, the estimate that this is eventually contracting and this gives lambda tilde minus n minus 1 times c times lambda to the n Okay. And this gives exactly equal to, uh, sorry, here I want a V. Okay. And here this gives C lambda to the n minus 1 times lambda tilde to the minus n minus 1 times lambda v. Which is exactly what we want, right? Because then this assumption here says, so this is exactly c lambda over lambda tilde to the n minus 1 times lambda v. And this is less than 1, so this is strictly less than lambda Uh, then lambda v, yes, and this is strictly less than lambda tilde v, which is exactly what we want for you. I may put what? I may put an equality. Well, but v equal to zero. <laughs> Here. Yes. Ah, okay. So you may say that, uh, okay. I may say that v is non-zero. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. So this shows that we have constructed by this simple formula, we have used the dynamics because you see this formula, this formula uses the dynamics, right? So we're defining a norm on the vector v in terms of the dynamics for the first number of iterates. And the fact that a is eventually contracting allows us to then plug this into the formula and show that this is in fact in this norm the map is contracting. Okay? Can I raise? Yes? <laughs> 
as long as your map is linearly conjugate to a contracting linear map, then it has a norm in which it's contracting. So the norm, the norm in which A is contracting is called an adapted norm. Because it's adapted to A, because it's more natural norm, because A is morally contracting because everything's converging to zero. So in some sense, that is really the adapted norm. And we can prove a lot of the results uh, where we can, in this norm, we can look at the linear map in this norm, and then we can prove that theorem about the, um, about the Lipschitz perturbation in this norm, and then we can apply that to these cases as well. OK, so to finish today this section on contractions, I want to talk about some very interesting applications and in particular about some local versions of the theorems that we have been talking about. So I want to talk about something called local linearization. And of course, about structural stability for contracting maps. So I'm going to state some results. So let me first write a proposition, which is a local contraction mapping. So suppose x is a complete metric space. Suppose there exists a subset u in x, which is also complete. u is also complete in the metric of x. And suppose we have f of u is contained in u, okay, and f is a contraction on u. Then what can we conclude? Exactly. We can conclude everything exactly the same as for the contraction mapping theorem. Right? This is a contraction mapping theorem on U. So it's trivial here because basically because f of U is mapped into U, then we can just think of the map f as defined on U. It's a contraction on U. U is a complete metric space, so we have exactly all the results of the contraction mapping theorem. Right? So then there exists unique fixed point P in U and Fn of X converges to P for all X in U and uh, um, as N tends to infinity. Now, we have two assumptions here about U. Can we relax either of these two assumptions? Because you could have, for example, x complete metric space. Think of Rn, for example, or think of R. U is a subset of x which is not complete. What's an example of a subset of R that's not complete? <coughs> Some open set, for example, the open interval, 0, 1, open interval. And then what happens to the theorem? Is the theorem still true? No, of course not, right? Because you could have a contraction like x goes to half of x and every point converges to 0, but 0 does not belong to your set. 
okay? So it's not true. What about the second condition? Is this essential? That F, F is assumed to be defined on the whole space, on all of X. We could still have it that it's a contraction. U could still be complete. F could still be a contraction on U. Can we have F of U not contained in U? No. Why not? I don't know what you mean by L and X. L and X is uh, operation uh, in place of E. Natural operation E. Yes, I know, but I don't understand your example. No, uh, you can take something, some example like this. You can take easily an example in which you have a map on the real line that takes, for example, the unit interval. It shrinks it, but it maps it somewhere else. And then it shrinks it again, but it maps it more towards infinity the whole time. So it can be a contraction on U and even on all details of U, but of course U does not map into itself, so it might not have a fixed point. Okay? Probably you were thinking of a similar kind of example like that. Okay? So this is just an observation. So I will not, you know, I will not prove this because this is just a kind of trivial proof. Let me leave it as an exercise. It's just a question of making this observation that it's a contraction. Um, but there's an interesting application here, which is also local version. I'm writing, I'm going to write a whole list of local versions of theorems we proved in the first two lectures. So, proposition. Let F from Rn to Rn be a C1 map. P be a fixed point and suppose that df of P is less than 1. Then then P is an attracting fixed point, is a locally, is a locally attracting fixed point. Do you remember what a locally attracting fixed point means? Yeah? It means there's a neighborhood of point where everything converges to the fixed point. Okay? So what is the proof of this theorem? That's right. Again, the mean value theorem, or, I mean, yes, exactly. You can apply directly as a mean value theorem to show that this is a um, contraction in neighborhood of P. Okay? And to show that there's a neighborhood that is mapped inside itself. What is the key property? Do we use the, C, the fact that it's a C1 map here? How do we use the fact that it's a C1 map? Remember, okay, that there's a difference between the assumptions of this proposition. It seems very simple, but here we're only assuming this at the fixed point, okay? We're not assuming this everywhere. This is a very important difference. In the previous proposition, we said, suppose the derivative is contracting everywhere. Okay? Now we're just assuming it's at the fixed point. So even though this is an elementary result, it's an example of a very important class of results where we make an assumptions about the dynamics at one point and we deduce something about the dynamics in a neighborhood of that point. It's a quite a significant step. So how are we able to pass from this information to the information about the neighborhood? In other words, how do we show that there's a neighborhood that maps into itself and on which F is a contraction? Yes. Yes, we have C1 and the differential is continuous. Exactly. So by continuity of the derivative, the norm will also be strictly less than 1 in some neighborhood of P, and then we can apply this result, okay? This is a simple but very important step, okay? So proof, since F 
is C1, there exists a neighborhood U of P such that DF X is strictly less than 1 for all X in U. Okay, yes. You're right, you're right, yes. I guess we don't really need X to be a complete metric space. As long as U is complete, yes. Okay, that's correct, of course. We do not use the completeness of X in any way if we assume that U is complete. So then, by the mean value theorem, uh, F is a contraction on U, and F of U is contained in U. Okay? And so we apply the local contraction mapping theorem and we get the result. So, again, this comment about the norm, this is a norm that we're given on Rn. As we said before, it's a little bit restrictive to assume that the linear map is contracting because we know that there's many linear maps that are still morally contracting but are not strictly contracting, but they have an adapted norm. Okay? So is it sufficient to assume that this is true for the adapted norm. Do we still get the same result? In other words, I'd like to say, suppose this is a C1 map, P is a fixed point, and the F of P is less than 1 in some adapted norm. So we suppose this is an adapted norm. The f of p is a linear map, right? Rn is a linear space, okay? We have a norm on linear space. In fact, we have many norms on the linear space. Not only that, but all the norms are equivalent. You know what it means? That they're equivalent. Equivalent means that the ratio between the two norms is bounded above and below uniformly for every vector, okay? So the important property about equivalent norms is that if you have a converging sequence, it will be converging in any of these norms. In particular, if the orbits converge to the origin, they will converge to the origin in any of these norms. You know, these norms will converge to zero in all of these norms, okay? Which is what we're trying to show is that everything is converging to the fixed point, so in a neighborhood of P, you have some contraction and everything is converging to P. Right? So it is sufficient. So this norm is a norm on Rn. The norm on the derivative is defined in terms of the norm that we define on Rn. So if we change, if we take any norm on Rn, it's sufficient to get that the derivative is contracting in some norm in Rn to conclude that P is locally attracting in that norm, but obviously if it's locally attracting in that norm, it's locally attracting topologically. It doesn't depend on the norm whether it's locally attracting or not. Okay? So this is an interesting result because this is now no longer in the world of linear maps. Okay? We are slowly moving out of linear maps. Okay? That was part of the proposition about Lipschitz perturbation of linear maps. Here also this is a non-linear map, but we're using the information we know about linear maps to say that if the linear map is contracting at a fixed point, then because the nonlinear map is in some sense in a small neighborhood of P, the linear map is an approximation to the nonlinear map, 
the fact that the linear map is contracting means that in a neighborhood of P, the nonlinear map is also contracting, and we get the same result. This is the model of this result. Okay, technically it's fairly simple, but it's important to understand the spirit of the result. Okay, and a question then is, for example, is the, uh, what about topological conjugacy, right? So let me prove, let me state a local version of the topological conjugacy between the linear maps and the perturbations. And then we will have a very nice application of that. So um, so actually, you know what, let's just take a couple of minutes break Stretch, relax your minds a little bit, and then we'll come back in two minutes, and I will do this last part of the lecture. Okay. Okay. So, so to motivate just these last few results, which I will state, let me ask the question, a natural question here, which is, we now have two contractions, right? We have this linear map, which is itself a linear map from Rn to Rn, and it's a contraction, and we understand the dynamics. And then we have the nonlinear map, F, which in a neighborhood of P is also a contraction. And in some ways, it is a small perturbation of the linear map, because the linear map is an approximation of the nonlinear map. So, you see, immediately we might think back at the motivation for the result that we proved the last lecture, which says that if a nonlinear map is a small Lipschitz perturbation of a linear map, then they're topologically conjugate. And we really, in some sense, the main motivation for that was exactly this kind of setting. Can we say that the nonlinear map in a neighborhood of P is topologically conjugate to this linear map in a neighborhood of the origin, for example? This is called local linearization. In other words, is the dynamics in a neighborhood of P conjugate to a linear version of it? So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to state these results formally. First of all, I need to state what I mean by a local topological conjugacy because these two maps cannot be globally topologically conjugate necessarily because we know that this map has a unique fixed point at the origin. The only thing we know about the nonlinear map is that in a neighborhood of P, it is contracting because we've taken the neighborhood U of P with this property. But because this map is nonlinear, outside this neighborhood, it could be doing anything else. It could have other fixed points. It could be doing lots of crazy things, right? So the most we can hope for is that this conjugacy is between a neighborhood of P and a neighborhood of the origin which is the corresponding fixed point for this linear map. So let's define what we mean by a local topological conjugacy. So we'll state it in general, in a general setting of metric spaces. We have two metric spaces. And two maps. Continuous maps. Suppose that P in X and Q in Y are fixed points for F and G respectively. Then we say that F and G are locally topologically conjugate if there exists neighborhoods 
N P and N Q of P and Q and a homeomorphism H from N P to N Q such that H composed with F equals G composed with H. And I need to add one more uh, one more comment. And that's the fact that these two neighborhoods are not necessarily invariant. So this needs to hold whenever both sides are defined. So I will explain exactly what we mean here. So we have our two maps, F x to x, and here we have a map g, y to y. Here we have a fixed point p. Here we have a fixed point q. The maps f and g might not be topologically conjugate to each other on the whole space, but we want to formalize the notion that in some neighborhood of p and in some neighborhood of q, the dynamics is topologically conjugate, so it's the same. Okay. So what's the natural way to define it? Well, let's suppose we have a conjugacy in some neighborhood. So let's suppose we have some neighborhood here, NP, and some neighborhood here, NQ, and some homeomorphism, H. Okay. So what is the only problem here? The problem is that we do not know that NP is mapped inside itself. Okay. In the case of contracting contractions, we could more or less assume that or arrange that. But this definition I'm giving is not assuming that there's any contraction. I just want to make a completely general definition. And in many cases, we want to apply this definition to situations which are not contracting. And the situation which we're not contracting, for example, a saddle point. Remember in the linear maps, we have saddle points where we have one direction contracting, the other one expanding. You might have, for example, that the image of NP is like this. Right? This is F of NP. So it might be that there's some point X here that maps outside here, which is F of X. Right? And H is not defined outside this neighborhood, H or F of X. So if we try to define this left-hand side here, it's not really defined at this point, okay? Because H composed with F, it means you need to take X, apply F, and then compose H, but it's not defined, okay? So whenever both sides are defined, which is, can be, you could write, in fact, let me leave it as an exercise to find out exactly when this is defined, right? Because it is precisely defined for all points x in which f of x continues to be inside NP. Then it's okay, right? So at least the left-hand side is defined at every point. So notice Uh, wait, let me write down. Exercise, uh, describe explicitly explicitly the region the region where the conjugacy is well defined. So the homeomorphism is well defined, but the conjugacy is not well defined everywhere. For example, the left-hand side, 
So let me write as an example, e.g. left hand side is well defined on the set of all x in NP such that f of x belongs also to NP. Right? Which we could also write as NP intersection f of NP. For example. Okay? So I mean, this is not as crazy as it seems. You know, it's not as abstract as it seems. I just write it like this in the, in the, in the definition. But there is a well-defined region. This is still a neighborhood of P. OK, so it's still defined in neighborhood of P. So I'm just doing this to emphasize the subtlety of defining local topological conjugacy, because you don't know that these domains are invariant by the map, and so you have to be a little bit careful about exactly what you mean. Any questions about that? Is that clear? OK, this little issue about the invariance of the domain. In particular, this still makes sense because it still shows that as long as that there are still some neighborhoods in which this is defined, a neighborhood in which this is defined, and as long as points stay inside this neighborhood, then they are topologically conjugate, so they match up with orbits that stay inside this neighborhood. So for example, if these were two contractions and NP was all mapped inside itself and NQ was mapped inside itself, then we would have no problem here and everything would be well defined and we really have a local topological conjugacy between all the points in those neighborhoods and it's easy in the case of contractions. So, theorem, I write it as a theorem because it's quite important. It's just a local version of the theorem we proved the other time. So, suppose A Rn to Rn, and A is a contraction in some adapted norm. I always write in some adaptive norm, but after a while you know that assuming this is the case is always equivalent to assuming that it's the case in some adaptive norm. Okay. And suppose F from Rn to Rn is a nonlinear map. F equals A plus delta F with delta F of 0 equals 0, which means that 0 is a fixed point for the nonlinear map also, right? Because F is the sum of a, the linear part and the nonlinear part. The linear part, of course, the origin is a fixed point. I'm assuming here, just for simplicity, that delta F also fixes 0, so 0 is a fixed point for 0. So we have that A has a fixed point at 0, F also has a fixed point at 0, and there exists neighborhood N of 0 such that the Lipschitz constant of delta F restricted to this neighborhood is less than or equal to the minimum between a minus 1 minus 1 and 1 minus a. Then what? What's the conclusion of this result? Excuse me? <laughs> 
Exactly. Very good. Then F and A are locally topologically conjugate at zero. And what is the proof of this result? So you see the assumption is local. Remember, this is the same setting as the general one in Banach spaces. In Banach spaces, we assume that this was true everywhere. Right? This was the bound, that delta f was bounded, and that the Lipschitz constant was equal to this, was this. Right? Here, we're assuming that this is true, delta f of 0 equals 0. Uh, I'm assuming that f is a C1 map, f in Rn, Rn. Fc1, F is C1. So I'm assuming the same properties of the global theorem, but only in the neighborhood of zero. Okay? But then if you look at the proof, then it's very easy to just repeat the same proof. Or what we can do, we can define a map. Define a map f hat from Rn to Rn such that f hat restricted to this neighborhood is equal to f restricted to this neighborhood and f. f hat equals A plus delta F hat, okay, with delta F hat bounded and satisfying the Lipschitz condition, okay? And Lipschitz of delta F hat is less than or equal to these conditions here. And then we can apply the global theorem that gives a global topological conjugacy between A and F hat. And then we just restrict this topological conjugacy to the neighborhood and we get the local topological conjugacy. Right? So then apply global result to get topological conjugacy between F hat and A and the strict A global conjugacy H so H restricted to N is the required local topological So, let's now come to really the interesting application of this. 
So let me write one more definition. Definition let f r n to r n the C1 map and P is a fixed point. Then we say that f is locally linearizable at P if f and df of p are locally topologically conjugate at 0 at p and zero respectively. So what does this mean? This means we assume we have a map here, F, nonlinear map, Rn to Rn. We have a point P. We don't know what the dynamics is around the point P, okay? But we have a linear map that is associated to point P, which is the derivative of F of P. And the derivative of F of P is itself a linear map from Rn to Rn. And it has a fixed point at the origin and it has a linear dynamics, okay? Linear dynamics we understand quite well, at least in the hyperbolic situation. Remember, uh, we have basically classified, at least for two-dimensional linear maps, we have a fairly complete classification. So the question is, is the dynamics in a neighborhood of P, is it topologically conjugate to the linear map? That's what the local linearization is. Okay, that's what I mentioned before. This is the definition. It is if they are locally topologically conjugate. So can we find neighborhoods of zero and neighborhoods of P in which these two are topologically conjugate? So with everything we've done so far, what can we prove about topological conjugacy? Can we prove something about topological conjugacy here, about local linearization? What results do we have available? First of all, we've been concentrating on contractions. So let's assume that this fixed point is a contracting fixed point, right? In an adapted norm, for example. Then this linear map is a contracting linear map, right? Do we know that these two are top locally topologically conjugate? And how? So while you think about it, I will state this result, and then we will discuss. The proof is just application of the results that I have been, that we have proved, that I have been stating. So, theorem F Rn to Rn, C1 map, P is a fixed point. Suppose df of p is less than 1 in some adapted norm. Then uh, f is locally linearizable at P. And why is this true? 
you could say this is the main result of the section. Okay, I did not state it at the beginning. You could say this is almost the, the main result. Now it will follow just as an almost trivial corollary of everything we've done before. But in some sense, it's the main motivation. Because, again, it is an assumption about a single point, the derivative at a single point, right? And the conclusion is about the neighborhood of that point, right? The previous proposition I wrote was a weaker form of this. Remember when I emphasized this fact that we're going from the point to the neighborhood, all we prove there is that if this is contracting, then P is a locally attracting fixed point. Now we are saying much more. We're saying that not only is, the P, is P locally attracting, but the attracting nature, the, the map in the neighborhood of P is topological conjugate to the specific linear map that is there. Okay, so it's a much stronger version. Okay, come on. What's the proof? Uh, yes, we only need a weak form of that, but that's the basic idea. We want to apply the previous theorem that I just stated. Right? So you write in the Taylor formula in the sense that we want to write F in a neighborhood of P as the linear part plus the nonlinear part. That's what Taylor formula does. And that is exactly how we've been writing all these other perturbations of linear maps, right? As F equals A plus delta F, which is the nonlinear part, but right? How do you prove that this uh, residual Taylor part is living? Exactly, exactly. How do we prove this? So, so for simplicity, let us assume that P is equal to zero. It just makes things a little bit easier for the notation. Otherwise, we can just write, otherwise, define f tilde equals f minus p, which will have a fixed point at zero. It's exactly the same thing. So we just translate. We, we're, it's a local result in a neighborhood of p, so we can just pretend that these change the coordinates and p is equal to zero, and it just makes it a little bit easier to do. OK? So let's assume p equals zero. So in some sense, these are two different copies of Rn. We have a nonlinear map that has a fixed point at the origin of Rn, and the linear map that has also a fixed point at the origin of Rn. The relation between these two is that this linear map is exactly the derivative of f at zero. And this, of course, will be a key point. Um, so we write f, we write f equals a equals um, df equals, sorry, uh, f equals um, a plus delta a t plus the derivative, uh, sorry, a plus delta f, okay, equals the derivative p plus delta f. So this is linear part of F, and this here is the nonlinear part. Okay. So all we need to show to apply the previous theorem is that delta F is a small Lipschitz constant. And then we have exactly the situation that we had before, where f is just a small perturbation of the linear part by a small Lipschitz constant. Right? So what is delta f? 
So then delta F is equal to F minus DF at the point zero. Sorry, we decided we decided that the fixed point was zero, so I'm just going to write zero here. It's just the derivative of zero. Okay, so delta f is just f minus the linear part. It's just exactly how I wrote it here. So what's the derivative of delta f? Is the derivative of, what's the derivative of delta f at zero? Let me write it here, at zero. It's equal to the derivative of f at zero minus the derivative of the derivative, which is the derivative itself, right? The derivative of a linear map is just the linear map itself, so it's just the f of zero, okay? So this is equal to zero. The f of zero minus the f of zero is zero. So the derivative of delta f is zero. So we have additional information about what this nonlinear part looks like. But that is why it's called the nonlinear part, because all the linear part is in here. Right? The fact that the derivative of this is zero is saying that this is strictly the higher order terms of delta f. Right? And if the derivative is zero and the map is C1, then the derivative in the neighborhood of zero is small. Okay? So, so for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists neighborhood neighborhood, uh, there exists a neighborhood M of the origin, okay, equals the origin, such that the derivative at x, okay, the derivative of delta f at x is less than epsilon. Okay, just by the C1 nature of the map, delta F is C1, the derivative at zero is zero, so in the neighborhood is small, and so if the derivative is small, that means the Lipschitz constant is small, because the Lipschitz constant is just basically the derivative. And so Lipschitz constant of delta F restricted to neighborhood is less than epsilon. That's all we need. So for epsilon sufficiently small, for epsilon sufficiently small, okay, and so, and that's the neighborhood sufficiently small, okay, the conditions of the previous theorem Hold and F restricted to N uh, and let's see F and DF of zero are locally topologically conjugate. So let me emphasize that for um, for these nodes, for this course to be self-contained, I'm doing everything here for contracting linear maps, but this theorem is true much more generally. So this theorem holds 
basically for any hyperbolic linear map. Okay, remember, hyperbolic is any map where the eigenvalues are not on the unit circle. Right? Any invertible hyperbolic linear map. So it's a much more general theorem. That's also why I wanted to write the definition of locally linearizable, which depends on the definition of local topological conjugacy in a more general setting. Okay? However, as it is stated here, we really have proved everything every step of the way. So it's really, we have complete. One last corollary of this, we're almost finished, is again the question of structure stability we can now handle. Right? Suppose we have the same assumptions. Suppose we take a small perturbation of F. Is it structurally stable, at least locally? Is the new perturbation still topologically conjugate to F, or at least locally topologically conjugate? So we can now also answer this question. So let me again give the definition. So we have F, same assumptions as that, F, Rn to Rn, C1, P is a fixed point. So F, we say F is C1 locally structurally Table. If there exists epsilon and neighborhood N of P such that, such that what? What is the definition of locally structurally stable? you think? What are this epsilon and what is this neighborhood n of p? Sorry? Speak louder. I can't hear you. We can't hear you. Do you remember what structural stability? What's the normal definition of structural stability? All last semester I kept telling about structural stability, right? That's right. So structurally stable if it's in the interior of its conjugacy class. Okay. What how do we explicitly formulate this being in the interior of its conjugacy class. What conjugacy class and what interior with what topology are we talking about? So we want to say that if it is C1 close, so if you look at the C1 topology, there is a C1 neighborhood, an epsilon neighborhood, such that all the maps there are topologically conjugate to the original map F. That's structurally stable. That's being in the interior of its conjugacy class, right? Interior means you can find an epsilon ball around it that it's all contained in that same conjugacy class, right? So here I say there's an epsilon such that if I take two maps that in the C1 topology are less than epsilon, so I take G inside some epsilon ball around F, then F and G are topologically conjugate. Except that in this case, it's too much to hope that F and G are globally topologically conjugate because the only information I have is that I'm just looking at the fixed point. I'm defining the notion of structural stability just in the neighborhood of the fixed point. So that's where this neighborhood N comes in. And I want F and G to be locally topologically conjugate in N. Right? So F and G... Uh, such that if this is true, then F and G are locally, uh, yeah, well, uh, topologically conjugate. Uh, F 
f and g are locally topologically conjugate in N. So it means that inside N the dynamics does not change very much. So what's the theorem here? Theorem, we have the same assumptions. Theorem F R N to R N C one P is a fixed point. Contracting fixed point in adapted norm. Then um, F is locally structurally stable at P. Proof? What's the proof? You can give me the proof. What's the proof? Yes. Yes, you're right. So you're right. Because the last semester I emphasized that structural stability depends on which topology you choose and which kind of conjugacy you choose. So it turns out, and I mentioned that, but of course, that uh, generally the, let's say, the correct topology is the C1 topology because if you take the C0 topology, nothing is structurally stable in general, okay? If you take the C2 topology, then it's very uh, uh, difficult to be structurally stable. Uh, everything is structurally stable. If you end the right... A uh, conjugacy class is generally the topological conjugacy class. Because if you try to take differentiable conjugacy class, then again, nothing is structurally stable. Okay? So here, that's why I write it. C1 locally is structurally stable if you take the neighborhood in the C1 topology and the conjugacy is a topological conjugacy. Okay? So from now on, when we talk about structural stability, we will think of it like that, the C1 topology and the topological conjugacy class, because that seems to be the most natural one. So C1 locally structurally stable. Okay, so what's the proof? a couple of applications of this theorem. Yes, we take another G satisfying this condition. Sorry? Both are equivalent to the linear. That's fine. But the linear will no longer be the same linear map. Right? So, what's the philosophy? Of course. Since it's C1, first of all, there exists a neighborhood in which the derivative is contracting in the whole neighborhood, right? So step one, 
since f is C1, there exists a neighborhood N such that df of x is less than or equal to, let me write it, uh, less than or equal to lambda less than 1 for all x and n. You agree with that? Yeah? Because the f of p is strictly less than 1, so we can find a neighborhood where it's also strictly less than 1 bounded away from 1. Then we can take a C1 perturbation, and because it's a C1 perturbation, the derivative will be close, so we can still have that, right? So if epsilon d1 fg less than epsilon, then we can have the df um, dgx, dgx is less than or equal to lambda plus epsilon, which we can write as lambda tilde, which is still less than 1 if epsilon is small enough. Right? Because what does being close in the C1 topology means the derivative are close. In particular, the norms of the derivatives are close. Okay. So G is still a contraction. So G is a contraction on N. Okay. Also, because uh, F is a contraction in a neighborhood, then you can assume that N is mapped strictly inside itself. And so for sufficiently small epsilon, we can also assume that G maps the neighborhood N strictly inside itself. So we have a contraction on N which maps strictly inside itself. So G has a unique fixed point. So G has a unique fixed point. Q, also in N. So, to prove that it's locally structurally stable, we need to show that F and G are locally topological conjugate in N, so we need to show that F restricted to N is topologically conjugate to, Q, to G restricted to N. Both of these have fixed points, so they're going to map the fixed points to each other. So we need to show that, uh, that they're topologically conjugate to each other. Right? This, this conjugacy will map the fixed point P to the fixed point Q, and we need to show that it's, it extends to neighborhood of P and Q. So what's the last step now to do this? What do we know? about the topological conjugacy class of these maps in neighborhoods of P and Q. I think it's enough to prove that D, F, N, D, G are conjugate. Why is it enough? So it's enough, you're saying it's enough to prove that D, F in P and D, G in Q are topologically conjugate. Yes, Why is that enough? Linearizable, yes, exactly. So by this theorem, we have that F is locally, topologically conjugate to DF of P at P, and G is locally, topologically conjugate to DG of Q at Q. Right? So F at Q is topologically conjugate, is linearly, is locally conjugate to the derivative of G at Q. And F in a neighborhood of P is topologically conjugate to the DF of P. Okay? So as you said, correctly it is enough to show that DF of P and the G of Q are topologically conjugate. And is that true that they're topologically conjugate? Ah, so 
I sorry, I, I wrote this in a slightly in a slightly different way. So I added that as an assumption. So is it true that that these two are topologically conjugate? These two linear maps. These are two linear maps. Right? They're both contractions. So we prove this for two dimensional linear maps. In the case n equals two, we prove that the eigenvalues, remember if they have the same number of eigenvalues that are contracting and expanding, then the two linear maps are topologically conjugate. Okay? So if they're both in the in in the case of n equals two, we proved this final step so sufficient, so sufficient to prove that the f of p and dg of q are topologically conjugate. Okay? But in this case, they're both contractions. So for n equals 2, um, we have proved that if uh, two linear maps have the same number of contracting eigenvalues, they are topologically conjugate. Okay? In this case, both df of p and dg of q are contracting, so they have both eigenvalues contracting, and so they are topologically conjugate. Okay? For the two-dimensional case. Now, for the higher dimensional case, it's also true, but we didn't prove it. So, I actually, uh, I didn't, I, I copied as I was looking at the notes, I didn't realize. So to, to solve this little problem, I actually stated this result in a slightly different way. So I put as an assumption, as an extra assumption, okay, so extra assumption. Suppose that the f of p is structurally stable in the space of linear maps. And then we have this theorem. So if we if we have that extra assumption in the general dim higher dimensional case, then that covers this last bit because we know that dg of q is very close to the fp in the space of linear maps because we've taken a close, a C1, small C1 perturbation. So by taking a small C1 perturbation, we can make sure that this is arbitrarily close to this as a linear map. And therefore, if df of p is structurally stable, then automatically it implies that these two are topologically conjugate, and we get the result. Okay? Yes? 
for invertible linear maps, yes. So I'm always assume also that these are invertible. Sorry, maybe I forgot. I'm always assuming that we are always dealing with invertible, that the derivative is invertible, yes. Sorry, I should have probably stated it explicitly in each result. Let us assume always that the derivative is invertible in these cases. Non-invertible is a kind of a quite degenerate situation. So. Yes, yeah, so every one of these results I stated, assume f is c1, p is a fixed point, df of p is invertible, and tf of p is contracting. Yes. Okay, so the right way to see this is to have this extra assumption, and then this assumption takes care of the last step, to show that these two are topologically conjugate. In the case n equals 2, instead of, we don't need this assumption because in that case we have proved that any contracting linear map is structurally stable in the space of linear maps, invertible contracting linear map, with distinct eigenvalues. Okay, so yes, so with distinct eigenvalues. But again, it's true without that assumption, okay? It's because what we did last semester is to, to not get into very technical Issues, I always assumed that the linear maps we're talking about were invertible and had distinct eigenvalues. But essentially, all the results are true in the most general case. Okay? So I try to make sure we have everything proved, but some, sometimes it's good to have an assumption that shows that the results are a little bit more general than that. Okay, very good. So this is really all I think we have done a quite thorough study of linear maps, of contracting maps, sorry, of contracting maps. Um, this local linearization and the structural stability come at the end as a corollary of everything we've done before because I wanted to present this this way, but in some ways you can think of this as the main motivation of the whole section, okay? These are the main results of the section. And if you look back at it, when you revise the notes, you'll see that everything that we did in the section from the contraction mapping to the Lipschitz perturbation, basically everything was setting up the results that we needed to then be able to prove these quite easily with that machinery. Okay. And finally, again, all, mo essentially all of these results hold not just for contracting fixed points, but for fixed points whenever the derivative is hyperbolic. So they're much more general, but the proofs are considerably more sophisticated in that case. Okay, so starting from next time, we will change gear completely, and we will look at expanding maps, maps which expand, and we will see that the techniques and the kind of maps have very different behavior, and we will address the usual problem of topological conjugacy and structural stability, but whereas here we constructed this topological conjugacy using some fixed point results, there we will use a completely different and new technique to do that. Okay? Okay. Thank you.